So I want to welcome everyone to our program called A Tour of Irish History with Sean Murphy. Before we start, let me tell you that I'll, I'm filming this event for uh, Milton Access Cable for later viewing. And also, I want to thank the Friends of the Milton Public Library for their support of my programs. Hold on one sec here, a few more people. If you have questions during the hour, uh, please put them in the chat box and Sean will address them at the end of his presentation. And also you do have the ability to unmute yourselves to ask something then. Now, let me tell you about our speaker. He teaches virtually and also at public libraries in New England and at social functions. He has received several awards for his work as a supporter of the culture and heritage of Ireland and also plays the flute and the tin whistle and he leads a traditional Irish music session in West Dennis. He was born and raised in Dublin. Please join me in a warm welcome for Sean. Thank you, Jean. So welcome everybody and uh, happy St. Patrick's week to you. Uh, we have a week of it here in the Cape anyway, because our uh, uh, our parade was last Saturday and, and uh, and it will continue for another weekend. So tonight I'm going to bring you through a, it's one of those things they say, never try to attempt, never attempt at home. But I'm going to try to bring you through uh, a couple of billion years of Irish history in an hour. And uh, as Jean said, uh, hang on to the end, you know, to ask questions. You can, you can send them to uh, the chat box if you wish. Uh, but you can also just unmute yourself and uh, speak. You don't have to turn on your camera if you don't want to. So without further ado, I will, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen with you. A copy of this presentation uh, is available to any of you who wants it, um, because with the material, I have lots of every, every, everything that I that I give you uh, has a source, you know, so I, I give you all the sources for the material uh, and have a reading list also. So I'm going to share my screen. And Jean, if anything happens, if uh, something strange, um, you know, happens, just let me know so that I don't keep on. I going. sure will. I, I sure will. Yeah. I shouldn't, but uh, I put on the uh, optimize for video clips, although I won't have any video clips. Okay, looks good. Okay, great. Do you see a bar at the top here? Yes. You do. Okay, see if I can get rid of that. It's one of those things that Zoom, for whatever reason, makes it difficult to get rid of. I remember that from before, Sean, actually. Yeah. Yeah. And That's being okay. Out of the see yeah. if it goes away. But anyway... Uh, First thing is, Ireland has been known by lots of uh, names, and I'm going to start off with a little investigation of that. So obviously Ireland, ERA, Republic of Ireland, Hibernia, Erin, Scotia, to name just a few. So in ancient times, Ireland was known by various names of Ierna, Giverna, Hibernia. Uh, in Homer's Odyssey, it's referred to as, uh, I'm not even sure how to pronounce it properly, but that's the spelling of it. And then also more romantic uh, references are in Ishfal or the Isle of Destiny. It was also called Banba, Fola and Eiru. And lastly, Scotia. Now, all of those four were queens uh, at one time or another in ancient Ireland. From the 11th century, however, the name Scotia was exclusively applied to Caledonia. Uh, for a while, Ireland was known as Scotia Major, and Scotland was known as Scotia Minor. But then around the 11th century, it became commonplace uh, to use uh, a number of different, still number number of different names for Ireland. And then uh, Scotland got its own name. And in fact, it, it came from Scotia, who was a queen of the uh, one of the groups that settled in Ireland a long time ago. So there's... Uh, other names, era, and remember, it's important that that uh, that fada, as we call it, is over the e because it means something entirely different. If it's just e with nothing 
on top of it. And then it's been known as Erin for a long time, the Emerald Isle, the Republic, the Land of Saints and Scholars, the Old Country, the Old Sod, etc., etc. Poetic terms then were Inish Fall or the Irish, the, the Island of Destiny. And then sometimes it's 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 personified as Kathleen the Houlihan. Um, and that is a personification of Ireland as a young woman. And then we have the Shan Van Vocht, which is uh, the poor old woman. And that was a poetic movement, uh, mode of depicting Ireland, again, as a woman. And of course, Roisin Dove, or the little black rose. That's another metaphor for Ireland dating back to the 16th century. Uh, there's a book that was uh, written in the 18th century uh, and uh, by uh, Dr. Keating. And he gives, uh, in running order, uh, the uh, the names uh, of, of of Ireland uh, throughout uh, history. So I give you a list of them there, and you can see the second one there literally means end of the world because for a long time and for a lot of people Ireland was at the end of the world. In recent times, the uh, the Irish Constitution or De Valera's Constitution of nineteen thirty seven, the island was named Era, and that's a, a derivative of Eru, who was a queen uh, of Ireland a long time ago. And in 1948, then, ERA was renamed the Republic of Ireland. Um, and then we know that poets and various others uh, would call it, refer to it as Aaron. And remember, Ireland has only been partitioned for 100 years of its 400 million year history. Because 400 millions ago, million years ago, as we'll see as we go through tonight, Ireland was uh, was formed as, uh, two piece, uh, as pieces of two different continents were welded together. So ancient Ireland, and I found this a wonderful quote that gives you a picture of Ireland through the ages. So the Ireland we know today was a geological accident forged between two continents and then frozen, dunked beneath warm seas, lifted in part to the height of the Himalayas, covered with lush tropical swamps, blistering deserts, and vast expanses of molten rock. And then again buried under ice, as in the last ice age, and finally thawed out to what it is today. So it's had a, an exciting history. Here's a photograph of the oldest piece of Ireland, um, which is dated to 1.7 billion years ago, and that's up off, uh, on the coast of Donegal. Now, the earth, uh, so let's just, um, you know, go back a little bit. The earth is estimated to be about 4.6 billion years old. Uh, two chunks of land floated around the earth's surface for millions of years before being literally welded together around 400 million years ago. Now, that happened when two old continents or paleo continents collided and squeezed two small land masses together. And then when the continental shelves parted, there were a few literally specks in the ocean. And one of those little specks is what we have as Ireland, a small little island. Now, obviously, it wasn't at that stage the shape that it is today. The oldest rock is on the tiley island of Inish Troll, and it's known locally as the island of the hollow or empty beach, 1.7 billion years old. Now, older rocks may yet be found, now, some older rocks would have eroded, melted, or were encased in lava and metamorphized into new rocks. So where did Ireland come from? So I'm giving you a, a big clue here. Uh, this is a, a kind of a chart. Remember what I said earlier, the island uh, of Ireland and the shape, the kind of teddy bear that we have today, that's recent. Uh, so... Um, uh, this kind of graphic uh, is again the uh, you know doesn't that uh, doesn't attempt to depict what it would have looked at, like over the years. But anyway, you can see originally, as I said, Ireland was formed as two uh, two ancient continents collided. Um, that was around five hundred million years ago. Um, then it, it moved because the as you know the surface of the Earth is moving all of the time. So it moved and by about 300 million years ago, Ireland crossed the equator and it kept on going in a northeasterly direction to where it is today. So we'll explore that in more detail. So here's two interesting um, maps. 
So we're here, we're going back to 480 to 450 million years ago. And on the left-hand side, the red specks in Laurentia and down in Avalonia, they represent the pieces uh, of the of both Ireland and Ireland, England, and Scotland. Then the second on the right shows you uh, uh, about 450 million years ago when a piece uh, split off and headed towards uh, Laurentia. And eventually they came uh, together and uh, we had the what some people call the British Isles. So sometimes it's referred to as a geological marriage. And it occurred when both land masses had reached a position still south of the equator in the mid-Pacific between what is now Australia and South America. Now, at one stage, those two red pieces that uh, we saw on the other one were about 3,000 miles apart. In other words, Dublin uh, and uh, Belfast would have been about 3,000 miles apart. So there was a collision of three continents, two of which contained portions of Ireland. So Avalonia, it contained Southwest Ireland, and it struck Laurentia, which contained Northwestern Ireland. And then a third continent struck both of them, Baltica. And that formed a new continent then uh, that we call La Russia. And that housed the future North America and Europe. So the United Plate then lay in southern latitudes at about the level of South Africa today. And then over the next three to 400 million years, Ireland was carried slowly northwest for a distance of about five and a half thousand miles to reach its current position north of the equator. And as I said on the original slide, Ireland has experienced being submerged, sometimes totally, being an arid desert, having mountains the size of the Himalayas, covered by up to two miles of ice, sometimes an island and sometimes connected to the European continent. So bringing us to more recent times, like 25 million years ago. So it's about 25 million years ago, Ireland was close to assuming its present position. From then on, a long period of erosion resulted in considerable soil formation, mantling most of the bedrock. And as the climate cooled, soil formation slowed down and a flora and fauna that would millions of years later be familiar to the first human inhabitants began to emerge. And the present landscape of Ireland has more was more or less formed. Now, during the last 1.7 million years, there has been as many as six periods of ice advance, followed by ice retreat in continental Europe. Each period lasted about 100,000 years, alternating with warmer periods averaging from 10,000 to 60,000 years. When temperatures gradually rose again, the ice began to melt, Glaciers retreated that dumped ground up rocks uh, as clay. So if you want to think about the future, well, extrapolating the current course of continental drift, it gives a picture 250 million years from now where the Atlantic Ocean has vanished and the continents again reassembled into a single supercontinent. Ireland, it is projected, will be abutting Newfoundland and in a position further north than Scandinavia today. So let's have a look at people arriving. So there's the Mesolithic period, 12 and a half to 6,000 years ago, and the people that were around were described as hunter-gatherers. Now, during the most recent, what's called quaternary glaciations, which is two and a half million years ago to today, ice sheets, literally two miles thick, scoured the landscape of Ireland. It pulverized rock and bone, and as such then, it eradicated any possible evidence of early human settlements. Recent scientific uh, analysis of bones discovered in a cave in the Burren in County Clare provides evidence that humans were in Ireland over 33,000 years ago. Bones of reindeers were found there that had been butchered by humans. Uh, prior to those findings, the evidence only supported the presence of humans 12 and a half thousand years ago. So that finding there brought back the date by nearly 20,000 years. Here's uh, Dr. Marion Dowd in the cave in County Clare. So radiocarbon dating of a butchered brown bare knee bone in 2016, which had been found over 100 years before that in 1903, that gave us undisputed evidence that people existed in Ireland during the preceding Paleolithic period. 
And that established the humans were on the island of Ireland some 12 and a half thousand years ago. And at that stage, that increased because before that, it was thought that there were only people in Ireland around 10,000 years. So it's changing all of the time. Uh, interestingly enough, that particular bone uh, had been stored in a cardboard box at the National Museum for almost 100 years before anybody got around uh, to scientifically examining it. But what's the hard evidence then of people? Well, recently discovered remains of two individuals in County Limerick, uh, their bones have been dated between 7200 and 6500 BC. There's also the cremated remains of an adult male who was interred with a polished stone axe and two flint blades. Um, now, the population of Ireland has been tentatively estimated at around 8,000 in the period when those bones were found. But there's no way of knowing. Here's an example of what people lived in. You would see there uh, a couple of uh, images of, of people. Uh, that helps to give you a, a, a an idea of the size. And this is just a model of a Mount Sandal hut uh, 9,000 years ago. Sorry, I'm just trying to get rid of uh, this piece here. I don't know whether it's affecting your uh, vision, but it's certainly in mine. Um, so, just one moment. So that's about 9,000 years ago. So the Neolithic period then was the next period, and that was the New Stone Age, 4,000 to 2,500 BC. And this brought about the revolution that we know as farming. Um, we really don't know what the origin of it was. I just came across one quote uh, and it says, a so far unidentified coastal population in Britain or the continent setting out in boats to establish the farms in Ireland at an unverified date and for reasons unknown. Now, some Historians call the tr transition from hunter-gatherer to far for the farming as the most profound revolution in human history. Now, it was more than a change in the economy. It also brought major changes to technology, the structure and nature of society itself, and religion. In some cases, its, introdu its introduction brought about major changes to the linguistic and gen genetic composition of the population. What we do know is that the appearance of the Neolithic period in Ireland is marked by major changes in almost every aspect of culture. Mesolithic camps, campsites, the earlier ones, were replaced now by settlements of from one to three solidly built timber houses. And houses were used year round, distinguishing them from the nomadic Mesolithics or the hunter gatherers. So here's an example of what one would have looked like. This is a reconstruction of a large, a large or long house uh, in Ireland. Um, and this was found in County Tyrone. It's on the crown of the hill and it's the focus of a settlement. Uh, it was discovered in 1965 uh, following bulldozing of the site. Now, obviously, they didn't find the building in this state, but they were able to reconstruct it from the evidence that they found. Um, pottery and flint was unearthed when the area had been dug up, and that prompted the area to be excavated. And evidence then of the Neolithic settlement was found. Essentially, what they did was they were able to find um, they were able to find all of the holes where the posts were put in. So, starting with that, and you know, other other information that scientists are able to garner, they were able to construct. Now, from a biological point of view, the, the Neolithic population of Ireland, whatever their origins, provide a baseline for defining the genetic origins of the Irish people. And of course, the big question is to what extent was the Neolithic population, in other words, the people who came after the hunter-gatherers, uh, to what extent were they the product of the local previous population of hunter-gatherers that changed their way of living, or was it the result of new colonists uh, arriving to Ireland? And that is an still an open question. So here's an example of Newgrange uh, over 5,000 years ago or 32,000 BC. It's a Neolithic monument in the Boyne Valley in County Mead. It's older than Stonehenge and it's older than the Egyptian pyramids. It's a large circular mound with stone passageway and chambers inside. So in terms of our understanding, we're fortunate that we have a, a, a pretty, you know, 
good oral and literary tradition in Ireland. Some of that has been passed on to us in books that have been written, uh, you know, in the last, literally over the last 2000 years or 1500 years. One of them is known as the Lower Gabala Aaron. It's uh, in English, it's the Book of Invasions or the Book of the Takings of Ireland. And it recounts uh, the history of all the peoples who arrived in, in Ireland. Now, the this book was written by monks. And when it was written, it was designed to be the origin story for the Irish, uh, for the people on, on Ireland. But as there were monks, they were writing and they were using the framework of the Bible and of course, their understanding was that the you know the world was it had been created and had been created within a time scale that was referenced in the uh, the Old Testaments. So again, they tried then to uh, fit all of the old oral and written history of Ireland uh, in into that. So uh, now, according to their accounts, uh, Ireland was inhabited by seven successive tribes at varying times in the prehistoric past. So again, we may well have had seven successive tribes, but you have to look, uh, you know, critically at everything from the dates um, and, uh, and and the rest, given the need for them uh, to, because in 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 that working on the Bible time scale, uh, it meant that uh, uh, the um, the beginning of the world was in the year. 5199 uh, BC uh, now today we know that the as i said at the beginning the earth is 4.6 billion years ago which is a lot longer than 5199 years also the origins of all seven ancient tribes appear to trace all the way back to noah of the great biblical flood through the ancestral lineage of his sons um uh, this book was written in the late 11th and early 12th century. So we get interesting information about, say, the first arrivals. Uh, and this is the place where we're told that the first people arrived. According And, and also, it, it's backed up by local folklore. Um, according to local folklore, the first foot was planted on Irish soil at Donmark, which translates as the place of the boat, on the shores of Bantry Bay, in the year 2680 BC. And here's the story. One of Noah's sons, Bit, had a daughter, Cesare, and there's different spellings for her. Now she, along with various other people, were denied admission to the Ark. So she and her family built their own ships and set sail, looking for a land which they uh, which knew no sin because it had never been populated. Because as you know, in the uh, in the story of the flood, the whole idea was to get rid of all of the people who had fallen into sin and start all over again. Uh, so the whole idea was to eliminate sin and start from scratch. So that's why they were looking for a place which knew no sin. Um, so her expedition found its way to Ireland, a place they knew apparently as Eru. And they disembarked at Dunamark uh, in County Cork. They landed according to the ancient manuscripts, on a Saturday, the 15th day of the moon at Dunamark. Now, there is a single, if you go down there, there is a single commemoration of the event in the tranquil gardens of the National Learning Network Centre in Cork. It's a work of art made in 2013 by the students of the centre under the guidance of Michael Ray of the West Cork Arts Centre. And it's called Voyage of Stories. And that's what it uh, looks like. So the Voyage of Stories recalls the pioneering arrival in the form of a boat sculpture made of steel, copper and glass and set up over a pool. And the glass tiles tell of invasions and emigrations, both ancient and modern. And those stories are given in both Irish and English on the tiles. So <clears throat> post-flood then, we had Caesar group arrived with three men and dozens of women. The men died off, and of course, as a result, the colony died out because they hadn't had time to create any babies, we're led to believe. So the next to arrive then were the Fomorian tribe, which were pirates of the Atlantic uh, region, and they were the first of the post-flood arrivals. They established a base on an island off the Donegal coast, and they remained there for a considerable time and ended up uh, fighting then with the next arrivals uh, to the island. And here's... Um, 
the Annals of the Four Masters um, is a record uh, that was completed in the 18th, uh, yes, the 18th century. And here are the list of the tribes that came. We're not sure if they're all Celtic tribes or if some of them were pre-Celtic. Um, and these are the years of the arrival. The Muincher Partalon, which were the people of Partalon, he was their leader. That was 2679 BC. The people of Nemed, 2349. The Fir Bullock, 1933 BC. The Tua Donan, 1896 BC. And the last group, the Tlanamila, 1699. So these were the ancient Celtic tribes of Ireland. And according to the Book of the Takings, uh, they were descendants of Noah through the lineage of his son, Japheth. So all five tribes had strong ties with Scythia, which is a large region in central Eurasia. What's most significant is that they all spoke a common language, uh, the original Celtic language uh, of Gaelic, which we call now just simply Gaelic. Eventually, Ireland became a monarchy, and it was the Fir Bullock. They were the first to introduce a formal system of monarchy in Ireland. And the Fir Bullock had nine of the 150 high kings that ruled Ireland from the royal hill of Tara. And under that system, they had a supreme monarch, the high king. There were regional kings who, along with their subjects, were governed entirely then by the Ard Rena Heron, as the supreme high kings of Ireland were titled. And that was a system that would prevail for the next 3,000 years with some modifications by the follow people that followed them, which were the Tua de Donan and the Milesians. Now, overpowered by the Tua de Donan, uh, who in turn were overpowered by the Milesians, we're told that the Fir Bolag ended up turning to farming and shepherding. Now, the Milesians, we refer to them as the Gaels, or the original Gaelic race, and they were formidable Celtic warriors. And they were the last, uh, and this again is according to the Book of the Invasions, or the Book of the Taking of Ireland. Uh, these were the last of the great Celtic tribes to conquer Ireland, and they arrived in 1699 BC. We get that date from the Annals of the Four Masters, uh, not, from the, uh, not from the Book of Takings. It doesn't actually provide us with uh, accurate dates. Their king, Milesius, or Mila Spania in Gaelic, he was an acclaimed warrior and he got his name having won a thousand battles. And you know yourself, Mila is the Gaelic word for a thousand. Like Cade, Mila, fought a hundred thousand welcomes. Now, the Milesians had already colonized Portugal and much of Spain, including Galicia, before conquering Ireland and from there, Scotland. Now, two of Mila's surviving sons, Heber and Harriman, along with his deceased son, Ear, who was killed uh, as, they, um, as they fought to take Ireland, they became ancestors to all the Milesian Gaels of Ireland and Scotland. And between them, they reigned supreme over all of Ireland for almost 3,100 years uh, before relinquishing their power to the English crown, King Henry II, in 1173 AD. So the next big event, I suppose, in Irish history would be the arrival of Christianity. So a little bit about, a little background for you. The Celts who arrived in Ireland uh, were originally from, from Europe. Uh, and a lot of them had been displaced in Europe uh, with the rise of the uh, Roman Empire. Because the Roman Empire, um, the Roman Empire had defeated the Celtic Empire in Europe. So a lot of them ended up having to leave. Some of them went to the Far East, like the Galatians, but some of them would have arrived in Ireland. And the last thing they would have wanted to see was Romans coming to Ireland. Um, so we know that Irish mercenaries fought against the Romans. Uh, they fought them uh, by, um, by attacking the west coast of Britain and the west coast of Europe, but they also joined armies and moved across Europe. We're, no, we're told that a senior military figure from Ireland was actually present at the crucifixion on Calvary. Uh, the story is that um, the uh, Romans decided to bring out a representative of every nation that they could find uh, over there, most of whom were, were prisoners, um, because they wanted them all to see the crucifixion. Um, now, uh, 
uh, this person managed, who is a military commander, he managed to get back to Ireland. Uh, at the time, Conor MacNessa was his king. And when he related the story to Conor, uh, Conor was so upset that he jumped up, started shouting and screaming or whatever. But the problem was he had, he had a piece of shrapnel in his head and it got loose and he ended up dying from a brain hemorrhage. Um, another thing that we know about, about uh, Christianity in, in early Ireland was that uh, a high king Cormac MacArt was apparently poisoned by the Druids. And he, he was poisoned because he had converted to Christianity. We also know that the two early saints in Ireland were St. James and St. Uh, John. Um, and the early Irish saints that predate uh, St. Patrick were Alby, Declan, Alban and Ciaran. So a little bit about uh, Patrick. He, he wasn't Irish. Uh, he came from probably the west coast of Britain. Uh, he was kidnapped, uh, brought to Ireland um, around uh, the beginning of the 5th century. From his own writings, we're told that he was born in a place identified as Manaventa Barnai, uh, but no one has ever been able to clearly establish where that is. And there's competing claims to between Wales and Scotland as to where he would be. Because as you can imagine, if somebody was able to say, this is where St. Patrick was born, that would be a huge economic boom to the area. His name wasn't Patrick. His name was Maywin Sakat. And he was. He also had uh, Patricius as part of his name, um, and that was because when he was um, when he was made uh, a, a bishop, um, that entitled him to be a member of the patrician order. It was an old Roman order, and uh, if you're part of that, it, it it you carry that as as a name, and that's where Patrick came from. Um, we also know that many of his siblings and relatives came to Ireland. And essentially what he led to Ireland was a a, a British, uh, because England wasn't a country at the time, it was just Britain. So uh, it was a British, uh, uh, if you like, British monastic group of missionaries that came to Ireland. Now, why did he come to Ireland? Well, simply put, he came to Ireland to establish Roman authority, Roman authority on the church in Ireland. Um, his main target was Christian slaves and refugees in Ireland. And he also took on to convert the natives. Um, so what had happened was uh, a number of events, mainly the collapse of the Roman Empire. Um, and remember, the Roman Empire had adopted Christianity as the official religion of the Roman Empire um, in the fourth century. So all of the parts of Europe that were under the control of the European uh, of Rome uh, were nominally uh, Christian. So when the um, when Northern Europe, people of Northern Europe and Eastern Europe uh, were forced to move as a result of people coming from in uh, from Asia and uh, you know from further afield in in Northern Europe, um, they were forced essentially to take over uh, the Christian areas of Western Europe and displace the population that was there. And a lot of those people would have arrived in Ireland as Christians and they would have arrived as refugees, asylum seekers and and and, and whatever. And, and that was one of the important factors that gave rise to Ireland becoming the island of saints and scholars because there was a lot of people who came in with a lot of resources. People who were well educated um, and uh, they got to work. Um, now, Patrick had problems because he was only allowed to come to Ireland because Patrick had uh, there were issues there because Patrick had been a slave during his years that he would normally have gone to college. So he wasn't deemed, he wasn't seen as somebody who uh, was educated enough to be a bishop. And for a long, long time, they refused. They refused even to make him a priest. For a long time, he was just a brother. But in the end, they needed to get somebody into Ireland because what they were worried about was that this mishmash of, of people who had arrived in Ireland who were Christians might not uh, might not adopt Rome as uh, and the Roman beliefs as their beliefs. So somebody had to be sent over to establish Roman authority on them. And that's why he arrived in Ireland. Now, we know he ran into trouble with the ecclesiastical authorities in Britain. We know that because he wrote about it. Uh, when he was in his early 70s, uh, he was called to Britain for a review because they wanted to get rid of him. But he refused to go. And he, instead of that, he wrote a letter. And that letter is called the Confessio. 
And in the Confessio, he defends his work in Ireland and explains his motivations. And you can get that online. Another work that's, uh, that was his was a letter to the soldiers of Caraticus, and you can get that also online. As I said, Christians arrived in large numbers as slaves, refugees, and asylum seekers. The population of Ireland in the 6th century was the highest until the late 18th century. And they brought a lot with them that contributed to the development of Ireland. Uh, and this lasted for hundreds of years until the arrival of the Vikings. So now we'll have a look, a quick look at the Vikings. Uh, they came at the end uh, uh, of the 8th century, around 795, and their power was broken uh, finally uh, uh, in 1014. So how were they perceived? Well, the Irish annals describe them as sea vomitings from the north because people uh, people experienced them uh, as, uh, as, as people who came and pillaged and robbed and killed uh, so they were not welcomed. Now, this poem was written on the margin of a manuscript being written by a monk. And it says, The wind is rough tonight, tossing the white-combed ocean. I need not dread fierce Vikings crossing the Irish Sea. So it began around 795. The first 25 years were simply raids uh, for slaves and any kind of mobile wealth. Um, by the 830s, they had got enough information and they had developed their ship technology and there was enough of them. And they began moving inland, taking advantage of the rivers. But in the 840s, the Irish uh, defeated them. Then the and, and these initial uh, people came uh, from from Norway and then the Danes arrived uh, around the 850s. Now, the Irish did get rid of them uh, in the year 902. Uh, huge numbers of them uh, ended up going to uh, Iceland and over to uh, to England, uh, but they did return. They returned in 914 and they inflicted a massive defeat on the Irish in the year 919. And it took the Irish uh, almost half a century to overcome that defeat. Um, and particularly from the year 9, 9, 988 to 1014, the final renaissance took place. And the final battle was on Good Friday, 1014 in Clontarf, when Brian Baru uh, defeated him. And then for the next 150 years, there was a, a renaissance in, in Ireland. But it didn't last long. 150 years on, we had the Norman invasion. And in 1169, Norman soldiers invaded Ireland and began a campaign that literally lasts to this day. The first 300 years, we had the Anglo-Normans and they tried unsuccessfully to subdue Ireland. Um, at one point, they controlled about 75% of Ireland, but over time, uh, they became more Irish than the Irish themselves. They simply went native. So England could only maintain rule from an area on the east coast around Dublin called the Pale. But that all changed then when the Tudors came to power in 1485. And they set out then on a reconquest of Ireland. The first thing they did was they defeated the people that were known as the Old Irish. Now, the Old Irish were the Anglo-Norman families like the Fitzgeralds uh, who had come in in 1169. Uh, they were now referred to often as either the Old Irish or the Old English, depending on where, 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 you know, on what, what reference you see. So there were the original settlers, and then uh, they had, as they came under attack from the the Tudors and the, the new English, they essentially began to marry in to all of the Irish clans, the main Irish clans. And from that period on, if you like, uh, the old uh, families that came in as Normans, like the Fitzgeralds and the Burks, they all now are were recognised essentially as being Irish for all practical purposes. Now, Henry VIII, then, after defeating the the, uh, the Fitzgeralds in particular, uh, he declared Ireland a kingdom and he forced the Irish chieftains then to accept uh, what was what's known as surrender and regrant, which essentially was accepting him uh, as the king of Ireland um, and uh, agreeing that they would become anglicised, which meant that they were to dress like the English, they were to speak like the English, they were to ride horses like the English, uh, they were to have their hair cut like the English, and of course they had to change their religion. And many of them did. So the two main uh, Tudor 
kings and queens, if you like, were Henry VIII and Elizabeth I. And they succeeded in defeating the Irish and destroying the more than 3,000-year-old Celtic society by the time uh, Elizabeth died in 1603. Then England confiscated the province of Ulster. Uh, they did that because uh, at the end uh, of the uh, 16th century, there was a nine-year war um, in which the Irish chieftains were defeated. Um, the last remaining Irish chieftains left Ireland in what in an event that we talk about as the Flight of the Earls in 1607. They headed off for Spain, hoping to return with an army, but that never happened. So once they had gone, um, the English confiscated all of their lands because uh, they had previously agreed on the surrender and regrant terms under Henry VIII. Part of those were they could not leave the country without getting permission uh, from the uh, crown in England. And these uh, Irish um, Irish leaders were being hunted down, so there was no way they could go and look for permission to leave. So once they left, then the, the land was declared vacant. And that was the basis on which the province of Ulster then was planted with settlers. Also, because the Celtic system was totally destroyed at this stage, the clan system had fallen apart. So for the first time, then England controlled all of Ireland. Now, at the same time, you had the rise of Puritanism, and then you had an English civil war um, uh, under Cromwell, and that removed the monarchy until 1660. From 1648 to 1660 or thereabouts, uh, England was a republic under, um, under Cromwell. Uh, Cromwell financed his war by issuing bonds repayable in land in Ireland, because the war in England was between the crown and the parliament. And uh, parliament were not able to raise funds because the crown, uh, the crown would have to agree to any measures, you know, to, to raise funds. So parliament had to go. Uh, it couldn't rely upon the the. the the treasury for its funding. So it had to go and find ways to create its own finance for its own war. And it did that by issuing bits of paper, bonds, and these were repayable in land in Ireland. So when Cromwell won the English Civil War, he had to come to Ireland then, and he had to remove by force the Irish from the land to repay his debtors. And most a lot of his debtors were soldiers because it was typical at this time for, uh, for soldiers to have to wait until the wars were finished before they would get paid. And typically they got paid in lands that they had helped to uh, take. And in the war that followed then in Ireland, upwards of half the Irish population died or were transported to the colonies. We don't know the exact size of it. What we do know is the population before Cromwell was around one and a half million. Uh, by the time uh, Cromwell was gone, the population in, had gone, some some people say by a half and some people say by even more. We don't know exactly, but literally hundreds of thousands of people died uh, from warfare. Um, they were sent abroad to fight in foreign armies. Uh, they were sent to the plantations in, um, uh, in places like Jamaica and Barbados. Um, and uh, a lot of people simply died of starvation and disease. Now, the Reformation was disastrous for Ireland. In the end, uh, we had two rival Irish kings, sorry, two rival English kings, William and James, fighting for control of the three kingdoms, which were Ireland, Scotland and England. Um, and that was fought on Irish soil at the Battle of the Boyne. Now, the Irish and the Catholics had lost. And at the Treaty of Limerick, which followed that, over 40,000 Irish were removed in what was literally the start of the flight of the wild geese. Uh, you've probably heard of that, but that's when the, the fighting people of Ireland had to go. They were, um, I, I suppose it was better than uh, being killed, um, but they had to, to go to the continent. And that was part of the agreement that was reached. We also know that in the next 50 years, almost half a million Irish uh, and primarily Catholic left Ireland, primarily for France. Some say that up to half a million Irish people died fighting for France between uh, 1700 and 1750. And of course, then uh, once uh, the first defeat was at the beginning of the 17th century, which was the defeat for the old Gaelic kingdoms, 
then by the end of that century, uh, the war really was between uh, over, you know, to some extent, over religion, because that's what William and James was all about. Um, and when the when William won, the Parliament in Dublin then was completely Protestant. So we had uh, uh, the setting up of a, a Protestant Parliament in Dublin, and they introduced penal laws, um, and that essentially criminalised people for being Catholic. It literally meant uh, your existence was almost illegal. Any act of demonstrating Irishness was liable to punishment. And that lasted for about 100 years um, when the French and American revolutions began to influence event, and Britain then was forced to make changes. Now, the Act of Union, which happened in 1800, uh, saw the parliament that was in Dublin since 1297 uh, taken away so that the people who were elected to represent Ireland then had to go to London. Um, now, that was done partly to make sure that what happened in, in the colonies uh, didn't happen in Ireland. They were fearful that the parliament in Dublin would get notions about becoming independent from the parliament in England. And there certainly was a, what was called a patriotic wing in that parliament. So they simply got rid of it. They did, they were, what they did was they promises, they made promises to Catholics, uh, basically they made promises regarding Catholic emancipation. And the church then supported them. Uh, and also the church supported England at this stage because of what had happened in France. The French Revolution saw the church in France uh, lose all of its property. Um, a lot of priests expelled, a lot of priests killed. Um, so they didn't want to see that happen in England or Ireland. So at this stage, the um, the the church in Ireland was prepared to support the English. But the English then double-crossed them. They promised Catholic emancipation, but it never happened. The Irish then had to go and fight for it for nearly another 30 years. So literally then, from the beginning of the 17th century, when England took over Ireland completely for the first time, you had 250 years where the native Irish economy and society was progressively destroyed. Uh, and it was destroyed because Irish people just simply refused to be anglicised. And the efforts of, of Britain then was to try to hold on to that and change it. And they were brutal in the way that they went about that. And that 250 years of progressive destruction, um, first of all, lands were confiscated. By this stage, by the time of the great hunger or famine, um, Irish people didn't own their land. There were tenants on land that their ancestors owned. Um, so at the beginning of the 17th century, about 80, 80 to 90 percent of the land in Ireland was in the hands of, of Irish and Catholic. Um, but that went down to less than 5 percent. So the massive destruction that was caused then by the potato blight um, that was the direct effect of both the historic destruction of Irish society and then also the emergence in the 1840s of ideas uh, like laissez-faire economics, which essentially preached that the only that you could not interfere with the market um, and that uh, the only solution was to allow the mechanics of the market to work its way through. And then, of course, there was providentialism. Providential was the idea that the Irish had brought this on themselves and that this was God's uh, judgment on the Irish. And if this is God's judgment on the Irish, well, then we can't intervene. We would be, we would be, um, how would this say, we would be offending God by, if you like, intervening to help in any meaningful way. Now, we know that the, the, the system of landlordism is what had created the basis for the mass poverty and the reliance on potato. Because remember, who are the landlords? Uh, 80 to 90 percent of the landlords in Ireland uh, at the time of the Great Hunger were descendants of soldiers who had been given land uh, in both the Cromwellian and Williamite uh, confiscations. And again, as I said, the economics at the time preached against any form of state intervention. Uh, the market was to be the best way forward. So the famine, as we know, in many ways completed the destruction of Irish society that had been ongoing for centuries. Deaths and emigration saw upwards of 3 million people uh, uh, of Irish people removed in one way or another. The Irish language and the rural Irish economy were literally destroyed. And emigration would now make way 
for cattle and sheep to occupy the land because that's what the landowners in, in the mid 19th century wanted. Um, they wanted to get rid of all the people uh, that were paying rent on the land. They wanted the land to be vacant so that uh, ranchers could take it over and put animals and sheep on it. They were going to be easier to control than people. We know that 7 million Irish people emigrated between 1620 and 1920. And of course, uh, by this stage, um, particularly and the deaths associated with it, uh, the British were very confident uh, that they now had full control over Ireland. So we know that by the beginning of the 20th century, British communiques they were expressing confidence that the Irish were finished. There would be no more rebellions. And they were all heading for America, where the English gleefully predicted the unfaithful un and ungrateful deserter settlers would be overwhelmed by the teeming masses of poverty-stricken Irish. That's the way they looked at it. Of course, the Irish then discovered a better word. Uh, so they started to use the word rising instead of rebellion, who had more positive undertones. So there was a Gaelic resurgence. The rural Irish rose, and by the start of the 20th century, uh, the British government had to bail out the landlords. They were in fearful that the Irish would actually manage somehow to take their land back and that the landlords would get nothing and England would get nothing. So what they had to do was to put up um, a, a huge fund, a bailout. Uh, under the terms of that, the landlords had to sell to you if you were a tenant uh, for a price that was decided by a kind of an arbitration. Uh, and they, they couldn't refuse. They couldn't refuse to sell you. Uh, then the Irish had to borrow that money from this fund and they were going to have to repay it. Uh, so, you know, from around the 1870s to 1910, uh, literally Ireland changed from a country that was ruled by about 10,000 large landowners to a country where you had um, literally millions or hundreds of thousands of small peasant proprietors. Now, some, uh, uh, mo most, most of the land then was back in Irish hands after 700 years. The rising uh, also uh, involved a resurgence of everything Gaelic. So we had Gaelic movements in language, arts, sport, theatre that strove to show people that there was a time when Irish people controlled their own country and they performed activities that were Irish and spoke their own language. The Easter 1916 rising, uh, the radical movement for Irish independence. Um, and of course, that happened at a time when the English rulers, they're actually out enjoying the horse races because in Ireland, Easter Monday is a big day for the races. Now, granted, the rising uh, in 1916 was to have happened on a Sunday, but it didn't. It, 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 it ended up being postponed until the Monday. Um, and the English were not in Dublin in their jobs when it happened and they had to come back in a hurry. But of course, they, after a week, they defeated the uh, rising and executed the leaders, imprisoned thousands of people. But that, in fact, was not going to help them because that was what led to Ireland standing up again. And by 1919, there was an Irish Republic with its own elected government. Now, the British refused to grant legitimacy to this republic, which had been voted by the Irish people. And as a result, the War of Independence began. And the Anglo-Irish Treaty of 1922 signified an end to the war, but it came at a huge cost. It came, uh, brought about a civil war in Ireland, very, very destructive, and still is a scar that will take probably hundreds more years to fully heal, if it ever does fully heal. And of course, partition, which we're still trying to, to deal with. Those who supported the treaty formed the Irish Free State and those who opposed it continued the tradition of the Republic. So the Treaty of 22 cemented the partition of Ireland. Six counties of Ulster now had a unionist dominated government that would use discrimination, gerrymandering and special powers to ensure majority rule by one community over the minority. 
Because in a situation where the majority are, are going to be able to rule by their laws, the fact that they allow you to participate doesn't really matter because, you know, the uh, because Catholics were entitled to, to participate. Uh, but it was such that you, you'd never get anything you wanted. So it was a farce. And that continued into the 1960s. And by the end of the 1960s, war had broken out. And that, that would last them for 30 years until the Belfast Good Friday Agreement in 1998. So that's my quick run through, folks. Um, I teach Irish history and I have two main programs. The first one is a chronological history that starts where we started today with the very formation of Ireland and continues, in fact, uh, you know, right up to today uh, in chunks. The chunks are monthly courses on every one of the important topics in Irish history. I also then have a second program, and that's the history of each of the 32 counties. So every month I do a different uh, county. Um, that's my email address there. I also have a website, irishhistory.online. Uh, this month in March, just to give you an example, the, the courses that are ongoing at the moment is the history of County Leitrim and the Tudor conquest of Ireland from 1485 to 1603. They're live on Zoom. They're also available as recordings because not everybody can make it to a Thursday night. Uh, and even those who make it on a Thursday night may need the recordings because they may miss a class for one reason or another. Uh, the course fee is $100. And again, the best way to contact me is by email um, or you can go on to the higherhistory.online. Then in May, I'm going to be doing the history of County Roscommon. And continuing the chronological history, then we get into the uh, the 17th and 18th centuries, the flight of the earls uh, and the plantation of Ulster. Um, so I have a bibliography here. Uh, as I said, this is available. This presentation is available to you. Um, so I will go back to you now and I welcome any questions that, uh, that you have. So, Jean, I see there's some... Something, something's in the chat. If you want to start me on those, um, yes, yes. Before that, I do that though. This was Henry the Eighth, the one with all the wives who kept beheading them that you were talking about. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, six wives. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So, all right. So we do have some questions. Let's look here. Um, the first one is from Elizabeth. And she says, how does the Giant's Causeway in Northern Ireland figure into the very early formation of the land of Ireland? I understand that Scotland is involved. Well, you know, again, you, ha you have the legend of Finn McCool, you know, and, but it's, it's, it's a legend. It's a, you know, it's a, a nice bedtime story for kids, but there's no reality. You know, the, the, the story that a lot of people believed was that there was a bridge built by Finn McCool uh, linking, you know, linking Ireland uh, with um, with Scotland. Um, but uh, it, it's it's just a geological formation that can be found in various parts, you know, of the world. You can see very, very similar type of structures, you know, those columns uh, that have six or eight, you know, sides on them. So, uh, you, yes, you have the story of Finn McCool and the, the what what uh, what what he he did, but it's it, it's just a it's just a legend. It's not it's not history. Not history. Elizabeth, does that answer your question? Okay. It's a good story, though. That's a good story. Yeah. I, I figured that it. W I I remember the story after visiting <laughs> Northern Ireland a few years ago. But I was intrigued to think that across that part of the sea in Scotland, that the same formations were found. And I was just wondering if there was a connection. But I guess, as you say, they're found throughout the world in various places. Yeah. Well, you see, the um, at one stage, at one stage, um, you, you know, the, 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 the two coastlines may well have been, you know, part of one another. Uh, it's just like today, if you look at the map, you, know, you, you take Africa and South America, you know, at one stage, those were joined in and the rock formations, you know, on either side, you know, on the, uh, the, the west coast of Africa and the east coast of South America. Uh, you know, the, the, the rock structures and the, you know, the geology is very similar because they were, they were, because uh, it, 
at one time all the continents formed you know came together and formed just one large continent before they broke up again four or five hundred million years ago so uh ireland and scotland would have been you know would have been united so that's the, so the fact that uh you know you have a similar rock structure over there means that you know it's something that broke in the middle and now they're 13 miles apart okay Thank, Thank you. you for that. But the Thank story you. about, you know, the, the fight between Finn McCool and the Scottish uh, giant, you know, the tale was that uh, the Scottish giant came over to find Finn McCool and Finn McCool's mother, uh, she decided what she would do is to put, put Finn into the baby's cot and invite the, you know, the, uh, uh, the Scottish, um, the Scottish giant in and uh, when she got him in, she said, oh, come over here. I want to show you my baby. And when he saw the size of the baby, he says, if that's the size of the baby, I better get out of here before his dad comes in. You know, so <laughs> but anyway. Okay. Good story. Yeah. Good story. Good story. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Very good. So the next one is from Eileen. And she says, Sean, please tell us the history of Irish people in the 19th century becoming slaves in Barbados around the time of the potato famine. I think it was usually criminals who were sent to Barbados. Yeah. Uh, well, that was in, that was in the, uh, that was in the um, uh, Cromwell time. That was in the 1660s, 1650s, not the 1840s. That was 200 years before that. So, uh, yeah, they, um, there's literally, uh, we don't know, uh, you know, possibly up to 100,000 uh, Irish people were sent as supposedly indentured, uh, indentured, um, uh, indentured, whatever. Servants, uh, servants. Servants, yeah, yeah. Uh, but you also had, you, you also had orders coming in, you know, for say women. There were lots of young women, you know, sent over there uh, because it, there was a demand for, for, for women. And a lot of it was, you know, to, uh, uh, to be partners for these men that were over there. Um, now that did happen. That did happen in the uh, during the uh, in the famine. You had Earl Grey of Earl Grey, you know, uh, tea fame. Um, now I suppose he thought he was doing a good thing, but what he was doing was taking um, shiploads of Irish girls between the ages of twelve and nineteen and sending them to Australia. Uh, you know, for all these men who are out there who needed a woman in their lives. Um, so. And the story is that a lot of parents were kind of pleading with him, yes, please take my daughter because if she stays here, she's going to be dead in a week or a month or whatever, you know. So it, it, it's, um, you know, it's, it's a complicated thing. But the reality was that, uh, you know, people were taken out. Then at various times uh, as well in the, you know, in the, in, the fifth, in the 1650s, there were lots of people who were sent over to Jamaica and Barbados uh, because people could just bring them, you know, to, the, to and sell them at the, uh, you know, wherever the boats were leaving. And uh, there's a, a lot of illegal cases, you know, that you can look at where there were actually people who were well to do and Protestant <laughs> who were who were kidnapped, brought and sold and ended up over there and then had to take legal cases over in Barbados to basically say, look, I am not Irish. I am not Catholic. You know, I should be sent back and had to take legal cases you know, to prove who they were and to try to get somebody to uh, undo uh, the situation. So there was a lot of, um, as we call it, shenanigans going on. There were, there were a lot of people who were uh, just rounded up and sold uh, to anybody who would take them out and then they would be put on a market, you know, out there. Now, the, the problem, of course, was with indentured uh, servants. A lot of them signed contracts, essentially, that after five years, they, you know, they were supposed to be able to get their own, uh, you know, land. But around that time, what happened, because originally uh, what happened was they were growing tobacco. And tobacco was grown on these farms and it was, you know, labor intensive. Um, 
And the plan was, you know, you came and you worked with somebody and did your five years or whatever. And then the deal was you would get a certain amount of land. But then th things started to change. You know, the sugar plantations started to develop. And, you know, uh, you now had large, essentially, corporations taking it over. And they didn't want anything to do with these agreements. So in some cases, what they ended up doing was essentially forcing people uh, into situations where they broke the contract, you know, uh, by doing something. And it was easy to intimidate people uh, into, uh, you know, it could be it could be as simple as getting involved in a brawl, um, and then you would lose your right to that land. In other cases, what they did was because there was no limit on what you could do in terms of requiring people to work. In some cases, they simply worked people to death, because this is what they did to the natives anyway. You know, all the natives on those beautiful islands that people go for vacations now, most of the original people there uh, were literally uh, worked to death. And then, of course, when they had them all killed and they realized Geez, we, we need we need a load of people here. So where are we going to get them? And part of that is the origin of the slave trade from Africa, because now they had to find people to come in after they would killed off all of these people um, in the mines and various other things uh, that were there. Hmm. Sorry, I'm rambling. I'm rambling at this stage. I'll take another question. <laughs> Eileen, does that answer your question? Okay, I guess I guess so. You know, I didn't realize so many Irish went to France, Sean. Oh yeah, the uh, the Irish. Um, I mean, well, around the time of the uh, you know when when the Vikings came to Ireland, um, they were raiding all of the. Um, they were raiding. They were raiding all of the monasteries. So a lot of Irish went, you know, to Europe and set up uh, colonies of Irish people in France and Belgium and various other uh, countries, um, and that kind of developed, uh, you know, over over time. And then you had, for instance, um, after the Reformation, a lot of the uh, a lot of the Anglo Irish, um, you know, who were descendants of the English came into Ireland in the 12th century who remained Catholic. They couldn't send their kids to be educated in England. So they had to send them to Europe. So they would have been sending them to places like France because you know, France was a you know one of the one of the main Catholic countries. So that's why they went uh, they went there. And there was a lot of trade done with France as well. Um, so the Irish would have you know gone to France. A lot of them went to Spain, Russia um, so so for 30 years after the potato famine or during the potato famine, they emigrated to the United States, the Irish? Well, they began they began uh, leaving in serious numbers, you know, in the 1820s. For the previous 100 years, from around 17, 1715, 1717, huge numbers of uh, people from Northern Ireland left. You know, there was something like three quarters of a million uh, Ulster, what are known as uh, the Ulster Scots, you know, left Northern Ireland. Uh, a lot of times it, it was in disgust, in disgust of the way that they were being treated, um, because as far as they were concerned, they had built up Ulster. And by the beginning of the 18th century, uh, London, London financiers and the rest just saw them basically as people that they could make a lot of money out. So... Uh, they were trying to argue that we need to be treated better. We're the ones who made this place profitable for you. And now you're forcing us to accept all of these terms that are essentially uh, making us, um, making us, uh, they're impoverishing us. Uh, so, as I said, about three quarters of a million of them left from around 1717 to uh, the start of the Civil War here. The English did a lot of terrible things. <laughs> they really did. Like, you know, when you hear yeah. these stories. Okay, so let's see here. We have another question from Steve. What are the requirements for Irish citizenship for Americans with Irish ancestors? Are there any benefits to having dual American and Irish citizenship? I think if you have, you know, I don't know what, uh, two generations back or something like that. Uh, the main benefit, of course, is that you have access to Europe with an Irish passport. And if you have an Irish passport, you can go to parts of the world where you're likely to be um, safer. Because there's lots of parts of the world, if you're an American, there's, you know, chance somebody's going to kidnap you to, you know, for political reasons or whatever. But if you're Irish, you know, they're not, they're no interest, you know, in, in anything like that. So the passport can be useful for traveling. 
in in pl places that are dangerous for Amer for a person with an American passport uh, to go to. Uh, and of course, the other thing is, if you have your passport, well, then your kids and your grandkids can also get Irish citizenship. So I would recommend it. I, I would certainly recommend it. Uh, well, it's just like I recommend to Irish people who are here, get an American passport. A lot of people who are here for a long time don't realize if you're on a green card or, you know, some other status that, uh, you know, if you if, if you were involved in a serious, even a serious accident where it, it was a DUI or something, you can end up, even if you're 40, 50 years here, you could be sent back to Ireland. Hmm. Now, is that yeah. true with many in extreme, other countries? In extreme situations, but you can avoid that by having a, a U.S. passport. Is that Which true for other thousand. countries, though, Sean? Like, you know, my husband's parents were both originally from Canada, so he could get dual citizenship in Canada. I mean, is that true for most countries? Um, heritage? Or does it just depend? Probably just depends. That, that I don't know. That I don't know. Yeah, interesting. Steve, do you, do you have any other question related to that? I think maybe he's not... Uh, Okay. okay. I, I, um, so there's, there's no tax advantages or disadvantages uh, if, if you were to have assets in Ireland. Uh, or you, you probably don't even know. Uh, no, I, 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 <laughs> I'm not somebody who has a lot of assets in this country or in Ireland, but th I, I don't, I don't believe there is. Um, uh, you know, um, there's nothing obvious. Uh, you know, I mean, I've never heard anybody, you know, here, you, you know, use that as an argument. Uh, you know, so I'm not sure. A friend of a friend of mine uh, wanted to buy a. A, a retirement farm or something over in Ireland from the village where his family was from, uh, not to live there full time, just to go there from time to time. Uh, he was told you had to be an Irish citizen to buy and own land in Ireland. Is that true yes, or is it there, still true? Yeah, there is. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're right there. Um, in some cases, in some cases, um, you have to have a, a recent connection with the area. You could be Irish, uh, but if you're not from that locality, you may not be able to get it. But I think you're right. If you if you don't have an Irish passport, you can forget about it altogether. You know, with an Irish passport, there 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 would be some places that uh, you you would. So there's uh, a lot of areas. Politically, they're they're trying their best, you know, to uh, to keep it as Irish as possible. Um, so um, it's it's not just Americans; it's you know any anybody you know who's not from the area would have a, a tough time, you know, getting uh, permission to um, uh, to own. Um, or okay. to, you know, to build, we to do build have a few thing. more uh, questions just to get to here. Sean, okay, so I just say, can I just say before that, in case on 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 Sunday and Paddy's day, um, I'm going to be uh, giving a, a talk that's open to anybody. It's a talk on St. Patrick, the life and times of St. Patrick, and I can send the or make the uh, you know the Zoom. It's on Zoom. I can make the Zoom link available to anyone who can let me know they're interested. Yeah, I mean, if you want to send it to me, I can send it to everyone who registered if they're interested. Okay. I okay. what I'll do is I'll okay, send yeah. I'll send you the, the link and uh yeah. Okay, good, good. Let me just share that Arlene said there was a slave revolt in Barbados, I believe in the mid seventeenth century. On further inspection of my reports, the slaves were Irish who had been deported. That's right. There was many a slave revolt. There was also a slave revolt in Iceland. Yeah. Um and the, the, the in fact that didn't work out too well because they, they ended up just deciding to kill all the Irish after the slave revolt. It was the biggest, uh, the one in Iceland was the biggest slave revolt since Spartacus's time. Oh, interesting. And uh, a lot of Irish, you know, women were there because something like uh, 70 to 80 percent uh, of women uh, in, in, in Iceland uh, had genetic, Irish genetic uh, roots. makeup. Roots. Huh. Yeah, roots, yeah. Brittany says, thank you so much. That was fascinating. I'm heading to Dublin in April and I will be ready. 
Grace, and, Grace. <laughs> um, Steve says, how did the Irish gain so much influence over Appalachian and Deep South music in America? Well, that's interesting. Yeah. Well, the Irish, the, you know, uh, the Irish, there was always a lot of Irish people playing music and they brought their music with them wherever they went, you know. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, they, the, the Irish would have been down there at an early stage and would have been playing their fiddles and other instruments yeah, and would have influenced the, the music folk. there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, one more here. Let's just see. Um, did the Irish fight more for the North or the South in the American Civil War or were they equally on both sides? That is... I'd say there was well, there was a lot on both sides. You know, it was a very, it was a very divisive issue. You know, in in Ireland, uh, you know, for instance, Daniel O'Connell, uh, you know, who was a, a major Irish uh, uh, leader. He, you know, he 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 was pro abolition, um, and he refused to come over. And there was issues about him coming. You know, here anyway. You, you know, because the Irish community. Uh, when he came over, his his uh, abolitionist views were, I suppose, uh, were not liked by certain parts of the Irish uh, community. Um, and again, when the Irish arrived, you know, some of them ended up, you know, going to a place like Boston and New York, but a lot of them went, uh, you know, to Virginia, uh, New Orleans. Uh, so they ended up going south, and I suppose they ended up. Um, uh, fighting there, even some of the revolutionary leaders in Ireland, uh, you know, uh, in the in the eighteen forties, um, ended up being slave owners. Hmm. Yeah, so it's um, it's kind of interesting. It's pretty. But, uh, but during the but during the but but during the uh, Civil War, uh, if 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 you know if it was if there was always kind of arrangements whereby, and it was understood. That there would be meetings, um, and people from both the you know the, the 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 Union Army and the Southern Army would go to hotels for meetings to discuss Ireland, and discuss things like what they were going to do to help Ireland when the Civil War uh, came to an end, and then they would leave the meeting, go back to their sites, and fight each other the next day. Although huh. they would probably have reached some agreements about how they were going to. Uh, meet one another in war, um, but yeah, they used to meet, um, and that was agreed on. Um, it was something that they couldn't stop. And then, of course, we know that after the civil war here, uh, the Irish movement here split really into two wings. One believed that the best option was to go into Canada and take over Canada, and then hold Canada uh, hostage. For Ireland, so England would have a choice. You can either get Canada back, but to do that, you're going to have to give us Ireland. There were others who thought that was not the right way to go. So there was a lot of them went to, to Ireland. So a lot of a lot, after the Civil War, a lot of soldiers went uh, to Ireland to participate uh, in uh, various events in Ireland. Oh, okay. We have one final question, and it's from Elizabeth. With the Irish passport, do you become an honorary citizen with all the privileges? And you kind of address that, I think. Uh, well, if you, if, if you get an Irish passport, you know, it's the same as anybody else's Irish passport. So it's, it's not like there's two levels. If you have an Irish passport, you're entitled to. Um, now, the, 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 the only issue would be around residency. You know, the residency, you know, would restrict you from certain things. Um, now there are there has been moves in Ireland to try to extend voting, to uh, particularly to Irish you know uh, emigrants uh, you know abroad, so that they could vote in the Irish embassy um, at various elections, but that's uh, you know that's something that might or might not happen in the future. Okay, Elizabeth, is that good? Is she still with us? I'm not sure. Yes, um, thank yeah, thank you. Oh, yes. Good. So, well, listen, I just want to thank you very much, Sean, for being here. You're so knowledgeable. You just have such a wealth of knowledge about this topic. And um, I think people learned a lot. And um, thank, you. thank you, everyone, for being here, too. And um, I guess that kind of wraps it up. And uh, Thank you. I, yeah. Okay, you, well, thank you, thank folks, you and, very uh, much. Happy St. Patty's Day to you all.
And like you said, uh, if, you want to, if you Saint want to Patrick. hear about St. Patrick, uh, and again, I'm talking history here, not uh, not fiction, you know, so you'll hear, Thank because you. unfortunately, a lot of people, you know, uh, what they've what they've learned before is a lot of fiction and a lot of narrative rather than history. So I just deal with the history. So, yeah, so Sean will send that to me and I'll just forward it to everyone. So if it's you Saturday, like Saturday to attend. at two o'clock. Yeah, it's I'll send that to you now, Jane. Okay, good. It's a way to celebrate St. Patrick's Day. So anyway, um, thanks again. And um, I guess I'll see you next time. So Great. good night, everyone. Good night. Thanks, Jean. Thanks, good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye-bye.